Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> I started this book back in 2003, so it's been a 10-year odyssey. But the seed for this book was actually planted many years earlier. Uh, it was back in the mid-1970s when I was seven or eight years old. And there was a day, I grew up in Westchester County, New York, suburbs just north of the city, and uh, am the son of a history buff. But unlike a lot of people who make that claim, the history buff in my family is not my father, it's my mother. And of her four children, I seem to be the only one she passed that gene on to. And so she took advantage of it. And one day we were driving into this city uh, from Westchester, and she pointed at a big building up on a hill. She told me that was the Bronx VA Hospital. And then she said something that I've never forgotten. She said that there were still men in that hospital who had never recovered from being gassed in the First World War. And this made quite an impression on a seven or eight year old me. Uh, even though I was a small child, I knew enough about World War I to know that it had happened a really, really long time ago. Uh, 60 years at that point. And it really uh, struck me uh, that there were men who had lived entire lifetimes since then uh, still frail from what they had endured in that war. And I didn't know really very much about the war at all. I didn't know what it was about. Uh, pretty much all I knew was that Snoopy was in it and uh, had done battle with the Red Baron uh, to an inconclusive result. But that stayed with me. And uh, it, it nestled in the back of my mind. And one day, in early 2003, uh, I was supposed to be working on another book. And I was doing what writers do very well, which is procrastinate. And I heard a gentleman interviewed on the radio. And he was talking about the World War II generation. And he said that World War II veterans were dying off at the rate of 1,000 a day. And that we needed to get their stories now while we still could. And that also made a very strong impression on me, but not in the way that the speaker had intended. Because for some reason that day, I thought, well, what about World War I veterans? I knew a lot of World War II veterans uh, uh, personally. I'd heard a lot of their stories. But I couldn't recall having spoken to a veteran of the First World War. And I wondered if it were too late already. Um, I did the math. 2003 was 85 years after the armistice that ended the war. I figured that somebody who was 20 years old in 1918 would be 105 in 2003. And I don't know about you, but um, the first section I read in the paper every day is the obituaries. Uh, so I knew that people did occasionally live to be that old. And I thought, well, maybe I could find two or three and interview them and get an article out of it and then go back to this book I'm supposed to be working on. Um, and that's the way it would have played out, except for the fact that I couldn't find any. Um, the first place I called was the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, D.C. I naively believed that they would have a, uh, uh, a printout for me waiting with the veterans' names and their ages, their addresses, phone numbers, and that they would gladly share it with me. Um, this proved not to be the case. Uh, I was told that they didn't have any <laughs> such database, and even if they had, they couldn't have shared it with me. And in fact, uh, several years later, when I was a few years into this search, I started getting calls from people at the VA asking me to share my list with them. So um, I moved on. I started calling local VA hospitals, VFW posts, American Legion posts, nursing homes, any place I could think of. And always the result was the same. Now, we haven't <coughs> seen a World War I veteran in 10, 15, 20 years. And they always signed off with, let us know if you find any. Um, and after a few months of this, I got very frustrated. But I didn't do what perhaps a more reasonable person would do, which is just give up and move on to something else. Instead, I got angry. And I decided that since I couldn't find any living American veterans of World War I, I would find them all which was quite bravado at the time, uh, since I hadn't found any yet. But then shortly thereafter, um, my stubbornness was rewarded 
uh, with the first big break I got in the case. And that came from a most unexpected source. Uh, in 1998, so five years before I started searching for living American veterans of World War I, the government of France undertook a program uh, wherein they would award France's highest military decoration, the Legion of Honor, to living veterans who had served on French soil in World War I, living American veterans. And this was more than just PR. They really wanted to give this away. And so they undertook an intensive search. They ran ads in VFW magazine and American Legion magazine and national newspapers magazines. And by the by, they ended up giving out about 550 <coughs> legions of honor to American men and women who had served on French soil in World War I. And I should note that they didn't just put it in the mail. Uh, they had an elaborate ceremony where uh, they dispatched uh, somebody from the French Embassy to travel to wherever the veteran in question lived. Uh, they put on a ceremony. In a few cases, uh, French President Jacques Chirac himself uh, presented the medal to a veteran. Uh, there was also a very big certificate. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Legion of Honor, but it's a very beautiful medal. Um, I didn't go to any of these ceremonies. And in fact, uh, the vast majority of them took place in 1998 and 1999. So it had been, by the time I started this, four or five years since most of these legions of honor had been awarded. I figured maybe 10% of the people on that list were still living. Um, but I needed the list, and I was fortunate in that um, I became acquainted with an adjutant at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C., named Nam Do Kao, half French, half Vietnamese, who was really moved by my quest. And on his own free time, he Xeroxed all 550 or so applications and FedExed them to me. And he wouldn't take a dime from me either. Um, and this, I should point out, was right around the same time that the congressional commissary in Washington uh, started calling French fries freedom fries. Uh, this was the spring and early summer of 2003 when there was a lot of tension between Americans and France. Uh, and while this was going on, I got my first big break in finding American World War I veterans from the government of France. Um, so uh, I had a list to work off of. It was awkward <laughs> at going at first because, as I said, upwards of 90% of the people on that list had passed away. And if you've ever called a house looking for somebody who's almost certainly deceased, you know that that can lead to some very awkward conversations. But finally, one day, I called the house uh, of a gentleman named J. Lawrence Moffat. And this was in, uh, he lived in Orleans, Massachusetts, right at the elbow of Cape Cod. And I'll never forget this because I called up and a woman answered the phone. And I had already had maybe upwards of 40 conversations that ended with somebody breaking the news to me that the person I was looking for had passed away. And so I guess I was a little discouraged. And I uh, asked her, I, I told her who I was. And I said, uh, is there any chance that Mr. Moffat is still living? And to my great surprise, she said, he is. And then, while I was still kind of gasping for breath, she said, would you like to speak to him? <laughs> and uh, I did speak to him. Uh, he told me a little bit about his service, uh, just a little bit. And we made plans for me to come up and interview him soon after that. And in between the time when I learned of his existence and when I first interviewed him, I became very nervous. And the source of this was my worry that, um, was I kidding myself, could somebody <laughs> really remember in vivid detail things that they had seen and done and felt 85 years earlier. I'd never met anybody who was over 100 years old. Mr. Moffat had been born March 6th, 1897. And I was really worried about this. Um, and so I got to the house. I set up my video camera. Uh, we sat down and talked. It was uh, very interesting, actually. He lived in a very small house in the woods on Cape Cod. The only seat the only chair in the house was a comfortable armchair that he offered to me. But um, knowing that he was 106 years old, I insisted that he take it. And so I sat in the only other chair in the house, which was his wheelchair, uh, and interviewed him. And I started the interview the way that I would eventually start all interviews, which was with his name. Uh, and started with easy questions and then tried to move on to more detail. And I asked him his name, where he'd been born, when he'd been born, his parents' names, his siblings' <laughs> names. 
things were going okay, but I was still pretty anxious about whether or not he'd be able to talk to me about the war in great detail. And then I asked him a question 